Good evening, I'm Jim Whaley. Tonight it's the great pleasure to welcome to Cinema Showcase a superb actress, Miss Vivica Lindfors. A great success on stage and motion pictures, she has written a fascinating book about her career entitled Vivica, Vivica, an actress, a woman, a life, published by Everest House. We'll be talking about that fascinating life and career, so join me as I talk with Vivica Lindfors tonight on Cinema Showcase. Thank you very much for joining Cinema Showcase, and right now, join me in welcoming Vivica Lindfors. Thank you so much for being here. Oh, listen, I'm delighted. It's so exciting to see your book out, you know. That must be a thrill. In fact, I, I can't wait until uh, the day I try to write one just to see it in print, I think, would be I so know. marvelous. No, it, at times it just seemed like it would never, never, never happen, right? Was it a difficult thing to do once you decided to, to write a book about your life? I think it's probably the most difficult thing I've ever done. Um, and so it's, uh, in fact, when I finished this, this book has been, took me quite a long time to write. I would say uh, there were some delays and complications with publishers, so that slowed me up for, another, for about two years. But otherwise, I would say it took me at least five years to write this book. And it never leaves you. I mean, you're like in a fever. You have to get back to this desk and this. I haven't been able to write a line since I finished this book. And I've, I've really been um, a little crazed, you know, because in a way, writing is so wonderful because it, it gives you a complete reason to live. And you really have to get back and finish that chapter. It, it, it's like you never completely alone you feel you you always have something that you have to do right it's, mm -hmm. which is a wonderful thing for an actress particularly in this country where we work so you know sporadically back and forth and we don't belong any place you know so this thing was like coming home all the time it, it it's marvelous to write it it really affirms something about uh, the good and the bad, you right? really see it very clearly. And when you begin to write and you sort of sometimes think, oh God, I'm gonna give it back to this person, right? <laughs> and you write, you know, out of your guts and you think, oh, this is terrific. You read it three days later and you think, oh, really? <laughs> you know, that's just boring, that's just revenge. And you really have to get down and you begin to see the other person's side. I found it almost most uh, interesting to write about well, my intimate relationships, like my brother, like my mother, my father, but about the men in my life, way back in my life, it was like I could see things in, in a so much more understanding way than while it was going on. Mm -hmm. It was marvelous. Was there a desire, though, to be any more protective about people in your past? Well, uh, I feel this way. I'm an artist. Um, I have to give from my gut. I have to tell the truth. <laughs> um, no blame, right, but the truth, right? A lot of people feel that's blame, true. But I had to, um, otherwise I had no business to write a book, I felt. If I was gonna say it, I, I would have to deal with what I felt was essential to tell. And a very good friend of mine, Paul Austin, who, you know, directed I Am a Woman, and also was like kind of a, a wall bouncer for this book. He was helping me all the way through. I had somebody to talk to, it was very important. But he, um, uh, God, was a, what was I going to say about truth, right? Oh, he's, the first thing he said, I said, I don't know. I hate to start with I was born, right? Um, so he said, why don't you just write down, write about everything that you felt was of intense importance to you, things that really had an effect on your life. So I started out by that. I just wrote, right? You know, it was probably like a thousand pages. And then I tried to organize it. And, it, and I was ambitious about the book in the sense that I really wanted it to go back and forth between now and then, now and then. I didn't quite carry that out. It would have taken me, I think, another five years. And I was just dying to get this book out. But 
that that is interesting. What makes what makes one remember something? Yeah. What brings it back up again, right? And what do you learn from looking back at it, right? Mm -hmm. That wonderful sentence that Lillian Hellman says, I wanted to see what was there for me once, what is there for me now, right? In order to understand today, you really have to know your past. Writing an autobiography and writing about your past must be, as you have really just said, such a, uh, a soul-searching thing. It, it brings out so many it of the is. truths that perhaps at the time you didn't, you didn't admit to yourself. Right. You saw things. You could see why the other person were doing things that at the time was so painful to you that you just felt, I've got to survive, right? Now you could see. I mean, I, I, was, uh, uh, I was interested by my own curiosity about the men that I had been living with that I seemed to have dismissed and not felt, well, that was over with, right? And then when I began to write, I realized there were so many things that uh, I now were really curious about and that I wanted to understand more. In fact, I love to write about men. I think I probably write better about men than about women. And I think it's about time that women write about men. Men have been writing about women so much. But there is a, it is, uh, I think, important to write about the opposite sex. It's like you get a sense of objectivity about, about them. We have to live with them anyhow, so we have to right. deal with it. Somewhat in that context, how do you feel about the roles being written today, be it for films or on the stage, for women? Everybody talks about how in the 40s, what with the wonderful roles written for uh, Betty Davis and, uh, and Greer Garson and so forth, how does the situation stand today? Are, are marvelous roles being written? But you know, that was such a wonderful time for women in films, right? Before the war, that whole beginning, right, when the talkie pictures began, you know, Garbo and Irene Dunn and uh, Barbara Stanwyck, wonderful, strong, independent, incredible women that I absolutely fell in love with when I was a child and thought, oh, I, want, I want to be like them. They were real images, right? Then came the war. Now, Betty Davis certainly was one, right? Uh, it seemed like a woman like Betty Davis was no threat at that time. It was like after the war, all those women became threats to the image of being a woman. And I think it had something to do with the war and that the Americans went abroad and realized the whole world is at my feet. I can get, have anything I want, right? I think the war screwed us all up, right? So when he came back and he found this woman who in a way had grown by being very independent during the war and cutting out with the business, etc., etc., And it was like a very difficult period for the two sexes to get back to each other again. He had gone through things that she hadn't gone through, etc., etc. And that was a real step back in the openness of relationships between men and women, the respect for each other. And it showed in, in the movies. The women were all the little girl next door, right? Or it was the sex symbol. And then McCarthy came in and destroyed all the gutty filmmakers in Hollywood. I mean, we're beginning, barely beginning to get back to some health. Uh, but it was, um, it was destructive. Uh, and now, I think that the, the women roles are coming back very much through women. They are insisting, right? Uh, they are getting more into power like Jane Fonda, like Jacqueline B.C. And, uh, and Candice Bergen. I mean, it's like women are saying, I want, I want to have, I want to be on, I want to have, have something to say about yeah. the script, about what I say, what I do, you know? You and it's now happening through them very much, yeah. I think. You made the statement in, in your book that um, you felt that Betty Davis and Joan Crawford would have made uh, uh, good producers. I would think that they would have made both tremendous directors and tremendous producers. But I think that, uh, that for them, it, it was almost impossible uh, 
for their own image towards themselves to make that step. They, I think they, I'm just assuming, I, I've never discussed it with either one of them, but it, I think it was like too unfeminine for them. It was too threatening for them to be in charge and run things like a man had run things. It was too early. Whereas today, I don't think we feel that way. You know, I mm -hmm. mean, women with Betty Davis talent and things is not afraid to, I mean, I, I watched Jacqueline Bisset on, on the Today Show the other day, right? And uh, I mean, she, <laughs> there's nothing more feminine, vital, marvelous, and she's doing her own film. Exactly, right? it's absolutely producing marvelous. her own film, yeah. And I don't think she, or maybe she, she did talk about the split of the image uh, and whom she is, and that she has to get, to get the two of them together. My book is very much about that. Uh, how, how can I be who I am? Um, I, don't, I want to drop the mask, right? Yeah. The mask that I'm, I feel I'm asked to have on in order to please you, right? Yeah. Whoever you are, right? Now, I think, of course, eventually, and I think that I've learned that in America more than anything, that um, the mask doesn't work. It's got to be you, you know? And um, if you come across and you don't apologize for yourself, they buy you. Sure. They really do. So that uh, it's true that there's a lot of conditionings and things in the air, but it is for me to get rid of it and, you know, go for the gutty thing, the vital thing, <laughs> you know. And, and then I think everybody comes your way. Yeah. And that was hard to learn, but I think that's essential. Let me ask you about... Um, I want to ask, answer one thing sure. that you asked earlier about, and I sort of driven away from when you said about writing about people that I knew, right? Now, I, I felt in a way, I feel in a way that if anybody is offended in this book by what I write, uh, there is a, there's some ego problem because my compassion for everybody that I, I'm not writing about anybody that I'm not compassionate about. There's everybody that I write about is really, a, somebody that I love, have loved, still love, someplace, and feel strongly about, you know. So I really don't, I think that if you deal with it from a very passionate human point of view, mm -hmm. I don't think anybody needs to be offended. Well, compassion, I think, is the key word, really, isn't it? Compassion yeah, is the key word, sure. yeah. Thank you. Let me ask you about... Um, <laughs> Glad. <laughs> let me it ask works. you about that fascinating period when you came to Hollywood. Hollywood. Yeah. Uh, you were already uh, really one of Sweden's top stars, if not Sweden's leading yes. female star. Yeah. What was it like those first days in, uh, in Hollywood at Warner Brothers? Well, <clears throat> I think I was intimidated. And, you know, Pirandello wrote a play called As You Desire Me, which is really in, in Italian, it's called The Way You Want Me To Be, right? I think I was intimidated about wanting to be who I am and trying now to make it in Hollywood, right? There were so many myths about it. But the first thing that happened when I came was, you know, I, I write about that. When I stepped off the train in uh, Pasadena, you know, <laughs> after three days on that train, I woke myself up. I, ha I, had, this, I had this image of this... Um, Warner brother, you know, Jack Warner coming with a big cigar <laughs> in his mouth, you know, kissing my hand and taking me down the train and the cameras would be snapping. You know, the whole thing that you've seen in the movies, well, Pasadena is a small station. It's very unromantic. It's, it's really crummy, in fact. And uh, the only one that, that met me was my agent and some lady, uh, and, you know, and, and, and sort of distant cousin to Jack Warner. She certainly didn't <laughs> kiss my hand. And there was none of that thing. I had a terrible time I had trying to hang on to this, this sense of glamour, you know, that I, wanted to, that I wanted to live up to and that my myth was all about. It took me uh, another week to even get on the lot, you know. And I was supposed to have come over to start a film. I had left the play and children and God knows what to get into this film. And I was just sort of casually say, I'm told, no, 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 I'm, you know, Lily Palmer is doing the part um, against Carrie Cooper. And 
I didn't even have the guts to say, what do you mean? You must be out of your mind. You brought me over to do this thing. I could, I'm going back, right? You know, it was like, it, it is so complicated when you are so young because your sense of standards and your courage of conviction, which I think is something that really comes with age and knowledge, right? Because how are you going to have conviction before you know? How do you know when you're so young? It's very complicated. So I, I can see in a way why people like um, Ingrid Bergman and Alida Wallen, those people had somebody like David Selznick who was behind them pushing, protecting them from whatever, so that, that there was a sense of standard involved yeah. no matter what. That, that didn't happen. See, I came, I think, at a very complicated time. As I said, you know, the war was over yeah. and everybody was desperately trying to get back to the way it was before. Well, you can't. Yeah. Okay. Interestingly, you write about um, one of the first things that happened in Hollywood was that um, Joan Crawford came up to you and said that she wanted to give a, yeah. a big party for yes. you, and that horrified you. Horrified me? <laughs> I mean, I didn't know how to live up to all that thing. I was pretty secure in my work, but I was very insecure as a person, right? And, for Joan Crawford to give me a party, <laughs> first thing I said, what am I going to wear? You know, I mean, I don't, have any, I don't have a dress to wear. I mean, it was like, it was too new, it was too much, and I was alone. I'm, I didn't have a man with me. I think it helps to have a man behind you. But, um, I mean, that party was an extraordinary party, and sometimes I think that Joan was looking for a a fantastic opportunity to have a party again. No, no parties had happened yet. It was like, it, but that party was like a pre-war party. And I think that, uh, but it was also a generous idea. I mean, I must say about Crawford, you know, with all the stuff that you read about her, that there was a, a really a, a, a two person, there was two people there. And for her to even make the gesture at that time, I think it was pretty, Fabulous. I mean, she was like, she must have been like 40 at that time. Mm -hmm. And he was this young woman coming from Sweden, and I was definitely a competition threat to her, right? What neither she nor I knew was that Hollywood wasn't going to make films about women like Joan Crawford and me anymore. They didn't make them for another 10, 15 years. Mm -hmm. So, oh, I could really write a book about the two of us. <laughs> yeah, so, you, you touched on that. So, you think really that. You, you brought about all the uh, the recent writings about Joan Crawford. You really think there were two people there? In Joan, In yes. Joan, yeah. And you know something? You have to understand that you can't blame. Blame is boring anyhow. You have to really understand that that woman was brilliant someplace. She was enormously talented as an actress, right? Um, the moment she was hit like 38, 37, it became less and less possible for her to even be accepted on any level. On the other hand, the myths about her were so enormous in the house and the, you know, the myths about Joan Crawford, but nobody wanted her. I mean, how does that feel? Yeah. To have such a name, seemingly power, right? And not being wanted at all, on any level, right? She wasn't wanted. Because uh, 35, that's, that was it at that time. Now it's 45 now, you know. And then now that, now that all kinds of new waves coming in and all kinds of stuff is going on. And I think it's a whole different cup of tea. But for her, it was over. Garbo retired, you know. And when I think of where I was at when I was 40, I was just beginning to have any understanding of my own human power, my power as an actress. I mean, when I was 50, I felt I'm finally beginning to know what to do with myself on the stage, you know, in life as a woman. I mean, I feel that way today. Mm -hmm. It never changed. And, and to, at, at that point, those women had to stop, you know. And see, if, if Crawford or Garbo had gone back to the theater, but they did not have the backup that somebody like I had, and not even Margaret Sullivan, uh, you know, felt the same strength, because she or at least was a theater actor. Because yeah. if you go back on the stage, all that stuff about age just 
yeah. it just it's flows out the window. You know what I mean? You fulfill you made, yourself and it doesn't matter. Yeah. You made a marvelous film with her, um, No Sad Songs yes. for Me. Yes. Still a beautiful film. Yes, beautiful, beautiful film. A little too sentimental, maybe romantic, but I remember when I did that film with her, she felt like a has-been, right? This was a wonderful part for her, a wonderful opportunity to create something, right? But you could tell the sadness in that woman. I don't, I read the book about her. I didn't see that lady. I saw a frightened, sad woman mm -hmm. that felt, I can't, you know, I can't make it any longer, right? And I think she was haunted by that feeling. And you could say, uh, well, that feeling is, was given to her by the entire industry. She had more possibilities than Crawford had. Crawford yeah. never stood on the stage. You know, Crawford would be magnificent doing Lady Macbeth, Mother Courage. I mean, my God. The presence alone, I think. Yeah. Yeah, right. Or Garbo, right? I want to show Christ, this. Um, crazy. I want to show this picture. <laughs> yeah, maybe you can uh, explain a little bit. Um, That's Ronnie. About it. Yes. What was the occasion for? Um, for well, this that film? was a film called Night and Tonight, and that's the first film that I did in this country, and it was directed by Don Siegel, whom I eventually married and had a child with, and um, who you know went on. At that time, he was a fairly unknown director, but he's now you know, very famous and big. And Ronnie has become the president, <laughs> and here I am. What uh, was it's uh, amazing. What was Mr. Reagan like well, at the time? Well, everybody, of course, asks yeah. me that, you know? And um, I look at him on TV now, and I say there's no, there's no change. He's, he's the same, right? But you know, uh, the other day I saw a shot of him. It was a memorial over Sadat, and it, it's, I think it's the first time I saw a shot of him where I really saw a thinking and feeling human being, right? So he, like all men of that generation, have, have this enormous burden to carry of having to present an image, right? And it was so marvelous. The camera caught him and there was no struggle. And I saw a very warm, beautiful person, mm -hmm. right? So, I, you know, I, I, I have not thought much of Reagan. I'm, at, you know, I'm on the opposite side of the fence, right? So, uh, but um, I saw something that I, I was kind of impressed with. Well, that was certainly uh, a, a people, uh, tragic event, though, too. Yeah, well, tragic, should, that should bring yeah. out. And of course, it hits close to mm -hmm. home. You know, being a president or something. Yeah. He was very um, radical in those days. He was the president of the Screen Actors Guild, mm -hmm. and he was on the striker's side, you know. Then he switched over, mm -hmm. but, um, well, listen, people have journeys. Yeah. <laughs> we don't have a lot of time left, and I wanted to ask you, of, of all of the films you've done, and many of them have been great successes, is there one or two that you thought really should have been a success, but turned out not to be for one reason or another? Yeah, that's a very good question. See, some of the films that were done way back, I don't remember anymore, right? Like, I don't remember Night and Tonight, but I remember that there was some good stuff in that film. Uh, I, did, I did a film called No Exit mm -hmm. by Jean-Paul Sartre, which was, we did it in South America under very crummy conditions. But I, I think that probably the film has some really valuable stuff in it. There's a film called Affair of the Skin that I did with Lee Grant and Diana Sands. It was a New York film, which I think had tremendous potentials. Um, in, in fact, I'm, um, um, A, I'm looking for a university who wants to do a film festival and bring out all those films that I like. Mm -hmm. Because I have to say, and it's, uh, sad, and maybe it's not too late, but I don't feel that I ever made a great film. I don't think I've ever made a great film. I mean, I can't say that I have a credit behind me like, uh, oh, I don't know, mention a great film. <laughs> well, I think you've made some, some good films. Well, I was on the verge to make something, right? But 
And I made a couple of small films that I really think are marvelous. Mm -hmm. 20 minutes was, <laughs> you know. Well, but so I, I'd love to have a film festival only of those offbeat films. I did a film called Weddings and Babies with Morris Engel. Do you remember Morris Engel? Mm -hmm. He's the first nouveau vague filmmaker sure. existing, right? And I did a film and it was dropped. That film was just never released. It was insane. It's never been released. It's a wonderful film. Well, it's so difficult to see something like No Exit. It's almost impossible to find a copy of that film to I look at. I can get you a copy. In fact, I'm doing, I think, a revival of I Am A Woman in New York in a small theater. And I'm doing it uh, together with a lot of films being played during those five weeks that I play. I remember when they're going to play all my old films. I can't oh, wait for that. Marvelous. Uh, yes. We've only got a minute well, left. But we should do that here in Atlanta. I agree. The Alliance yeah, yeah. Theater. I, sh I should play I'm a Woman then. I'll, do start, old films. I'll start lobbying for Ooh. that right now. I wanted to mention, too, before we run out of time, um, what a marvelous actor I think your son to be. Yes. Christopher. Isn't he marvelous? He has done There's so many. There's a picture many, here of him. He's done so many good things. And um, yeah, I don't know if we have it right on top or what, but. But we have a show that we do together, but. Um, He's hard to get hold of. Yeah, here's one. But that, that's a wonderful evening called My Mother, My Son, which is, deals with the mother-son relationship. And it, it is a, it's a wonderful evening. We have an absolutely marvelous time. To, but he's now, he's now doing a series, series in Chicago. Mm -hmm. And he's going to be rich and famous. And he <laughs> should be. He's absolutely wonderful. I want to th we are out of time. And I want to thank you so much for, uh, for being here. And I hope we can see you in I Am A Woman. Here oh, I town. hope so, yes. The name of the book, let's get a, a shot of it again if we can, by Vivica Linfers, which is a marvelous book published by Everest House. Thank you for being here. Thank you. Thank you. My thanks to all of you. Until next time, good night.